what would happen if we ran a regular secondary structure prediction method and predicted membrane helices? Would it work? It's a helix. Ask the question again? So, I, last, last week I talked about secondary structure prediction. I briefly mentioned them today. So, methods that simply predict whether a residue is in a helix strand or other, right? Why not apply them to membrane helices? Would that work? Is critical, as you mentioned? Then we have to do something else. So we have to add some additional component. But because just the yield information might be wrong. Should that work? Do you believe this will work? And argue for whatever you believe, whether it's yes or no, argue. In principle, it should work. However, maybe if it wouldn't, I would say it is because the helices that are in the hydrophobic areas of the membrane that they might be forming differently than helices that are surrounded by uh, some other non-lipid solvent. Good. Ron? Is there anything to add to that? No? Well, the same information. You no. need the same problem. You need yeah. It could work, but you need to extra information, exactly. for example, orientation or the residues which are on the outside if they're... But again, it could work. It may or may not, we don't know. Here we have to just try out. Here's the answer. This is one particular protein that I tried. It does not look impressive. Um, again, there are examples where it works a little bit better than this. Um, but, and again, so people have argued both ways whether it would work or not. And they actually, there's still a lot of literature that claims it works. Uh, and I don't believe we, we really have an expectation. Uh, some things look like this, so they absolutely don't work at all. Um, and that ultimately is because we have a very different environment, uh, most likely, uh, is explaining it. Now, how could we predict membrane helices? Well, one thing is ultimately it relates to hydrophobicity. So we can essentially look at the hydrophobicity of amino acids. Uh, so some hydrophobic residues are more likely to be in the lipid than hydrophilic residues, so we could build up a hydrophobicity index. One particular hydrophobicity index had been introduced by David Eisenberg, where for every single one of these 20 amino acids, you measure experimentally what is, how easy is it to pull this out of water. So how happy is that amino acid in water? How much does it want to stick together outside of water? Okay, and there's a score. Now this is one particular scale. Uh, this is an example for three different scales where the one that I showed you is in green. And uh, the axis here is an information content. Uh, this one projects it back to probability from zero to one and now we have five scales. Uh, it is obvious that in these five scales all reflect hydrophobicity. They are all experimental scales that measure hydrophobicity. Uh, it's very clear to you that they are not all the same. But if my question were, how would you figure out whether they are related? Well, you cannot stare at this picture, okay? At this, this, this. You will continue staring at this picture until you fall asleep. Uh, or, or something else happens that gets you out of the room. Or, uh, but we will not see an answer to, to, to this question in this picture. Because this is too much, let's say this is, too complicated. The, the relay, if there were a relation in there, it is too complicated to see. Uh, that is beyond what I do in a lecture like that, where I say, so find some similarities. Okay, maybe, maybe if you're very motivated and your thesis depends on seeing a signal, you will find a signal in this. I'm, I'm sure about this. Uh, but how could you do this? How could you figure out whether or not there is a signal? Are they similar? Are they really completely different things? Again, they set out to do measure the same thing, out of obesity. Did they come up with something very different? It's not quite right. Oi is an outsider a little bit here. But the other four are. Uh, I could just pick one and stick with it. That's, uh, it's a remarkably smart solution. Uh, because you don't see the problems when you do this. This is, the, this is the great advantage. 
uh, but I again I'm in a, in a uh, let's call it social uh, sense I, I'm absolutely not attacking that argument um, but in a scientific sense I'm, I'm attacking so the scientific question here is I give you those five uh, and then you no longer have the opportunity to say I have not seen four of them the file did not transmit I, I'm, you have the, the file in front of you so my question is how can you find out whether they yeah well we could take a um, structure which is predicted and use one of those methods or also alter all methods. Essentially, we will get back to that. So we essentially use every single one, we predict membrane helices with this, and we see which works best. And we will get back to that idea. What else could you do? To well, see matrix. Exactly, you could essentially group them in some way. And there's a variety of ways of doing that. Covariance matrix is one. Here you have sort of a, 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 a network kind of organization, a self-organized map produced by something that is sort of related to covariance matrix. So this uses uh, 402 indices. Now, however, many of these 402 are features that are very different. So this is a, an alpha helix and beta term propensity. This is other properties. Uh, this is beta propensity, uh, physiochemical properties, blah, blah, blah. This is amino acid composition. But you see this large group here in this clustering that is hydrophobicity. So about half of these 400 are hydrophobicity indices. Uh, so what is clear is they group. If you throw them in with other things that also in some cases measure alpha helix propensity, so it's somehow similar, but they are really different. So they're standing out from other features. That's one thing. The other thing, however, is it's not there's no one solution, right? And this is something that I believe is very important to remember when you think about biophysical features such as size, charge, hydrophobicity. They are very intuitive, very simple. But this essentially is our accuracy of knowing biophysical features. So hydrophobicity, there is no hydrophobic residue, right? There is an immense spread in which we can measure that. Um, this is important to remember. Okay, now in principle what we can do is we can apply it to a particular method and that brings us back to Gunnar van Heine who has done this first uh, systematically uh, one of the big big shapers in this field and Gunnar van Heine started this entire field of membrane prediction uh, got uh, that, that is one of the major things he's known for but also signal peptide he's behind that Excuse me. Yeah. Because I have a question to the to the hydrophobicity indices. Yeah. Um, they all work locally, so it's all residue. Yes. Specific. Yes. Because I was wondering that if it's not like if you shouldn't also put global information in it, because if you have like. No, no, but this is the this is essentially the idea that you have a simple biophysical feature that measures the propensity for being hydrophobic or hydrophilic or being measures the propensity of an individual residue for something. So that's the idea here. It's not predict membrane proteins or. Yes, sure, but but the, the my, my argument would be that if you have this one propensity of that residue, that might change depending on the residues. That's surrounded. That is certainly true, and that is certainly explaining. Uh, this is absolutely one of the reasons why we don't quite, when I say we don't know the biophysics, then ultimately this is because it depends on its environment. And its environment is also the sequence that sits next to it. So, whatever we measure, measure about an individual isolated amino acid is not relevant for the amino acid in a protein, or not completely relevant. And the degree to which it's not relevant is this. The degree to which it's relevant is that hydrophobicity differs from all the others. This is one way of seeing this, right. this result. Oh. Uh, that is true. So again, back to Gunnar van Heinje. Um, so here he's announcing the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008. So he's also uh, on the Nobel Prize Committee for Chemistry. Uh, a couple of uh, important papers with which he changed the membrane field. Let me just go for this one. I show the position in a protein. Uh, and it's sort of an average hydrophobicity index, and then I have two thresholds. And the idea here is uh, that we, in fact, we need two thresholds because we cannot find one that is right. And so the way it's done, the first threshold, the higher one, detects that there is, so I need to have some number of residues go above this first threshold here, okay? And then I say this is a potential membrane helix. And then I ask, well, 
how many residues do I actually have? The membrane helix is typically 20, 20 residues long, right? Uh, is the region, the segment that is above this first threshold, is that 20 residues? If not, then let's go to a sort of lower level, which still is uh, strong hydrophobicity, which still is sort of indicative, could be a membrane helix. Uh, so we use lower to threshold 2 here and see is this now at least the length of a membrane helix? If not, uh, and in some cases here, uh, here, here, uh, we essentially have a spike and we say this cannot be a membrane helix, okay? Now, if we used only one threshold, we would see we would one, two, uh, three membrane helixes, helices. Uh, let me see where the, uh, the real number is. And this is just the visualization. I was a little bit fast. Should have just shown you like this. Um, so in this particular case, those are removed here. And we predict two membrane helices. And in this particular case, I do not show you what the right answer is. Uh, anyway, so uh, the next story here is we also want the orientation. And with respect to the orientation, Gunnar discovered that if he measured just these loop regions here, so the non-membrane helix parts, and asked what's the charge difference? So he, I'm looking at the loops inside versus, in this particular case, the loops outside. They're, in this particular case, they're two. Uh, and this is one and one, and here is two versus one, right? <coughs> so, and the charge essentially is defined by simply the number of positively charged residues. And then the outside in blue, the inside in, in red, and you see there's a clear difference. Positively charged residues are more often in the inside. That's the positive inside rule. Uh, since you find this, you can simply look at these loops here, apply it, and get to a prediction which side of orientation you are. In more detail, you simply sum for the odd numbered loops here, you sum for the even number loop and loops and you look at the difference and whatever is fitting the positive inside rule, so wherever is more positive ch charges, odd or even, that's the orientation. Clear, right? Uh, now Gunnar went a step further and he said, okay, so usually in fact you would have these two thresholds that I showed you and usually you would optimize them such that they fit your known data. Do it once and for all. You have a hydrophobicity index, you have some two or ten proteins for which you essentially know the helices, and then you have fit these two parameters. Easy enough. But what if I, in fact, I know that this signal of positive insight is strong? So I can essentially change the threshold such that it optimizes the difference. So by moving the threshold up and down in every single protein, I will influence which residue is considered in a loop region inside and outside. And I will do this movement such that the number, the difference between uh, the, the loops and the inside and outside is maximal. The algorithm is clear. And that worked surprisingly well. And, uh, it's no longer working quite well, uh, but th there's a variety of di difficulties that came and they are problems for, for all methods. Uh, but this idea, really, the simple idea worked. Uh, very well. Now, here's another idea. Uh, simply try to find a hydrophobicity index that is such that it optimizes your prediction of membrane proteins. And Ron, you already said I have five, five uh, indices in this, in this slide that I showed you. Uh, they are correlated if all of them can predict. This is one way in which you said that. And that invites this sort of extension to a more generic solution that simply says, okay, let's find the hydrophobicity index that optimizes membrane prediction, right? It does the same thing as before, but it simply does it such that my index is optimizing this. This ultimately, if you think about it, is like a propensity, a propensity for transmembrane, right? This is the same thing we did in Gore, where we have an individualized amino acid propensity for a particular secondary structure. Uh, and here we do it for transmembrane helix, right? Essentially, this is like that. Um, now, I said, um, 
I'm not entirely sure why I bring bring that back here, so I skip it. Uh, yes. I have a question about the previous slide. The one that I don't know why it's here. <laughs> what I see is actually a very good prediction of the opposite. So is this a very good not prediction? Yes. So the the trouble is that we cannot. Uh, so what do you want to do now? When, whenever I predict something that is totally wrong, we swap it. But I don't know whether it's wrong before I know it's wrong. Because at least in example, it, it looks yes. very well predicted, just the opposite. Uh, so basically, essentially what you see is a polyvalent. And a polyvalent uh, is very likely to form beta strands in, in, in a sheet. Uh, I sort of I, I was the, the developer of this method PhD here, uh, and when I saw that I was and this, on one hand was shocked, on the other hand I felt like every expert would predict this here to be a beta strand. My method did too, so it learned something, and I'm proud of my mistake in some sense. Uh, so I understand why this mistake was done, and ultimately it is true that membrane helices are under different energetic constraints. The trouble is, how can I learn? How can I sort of foresee that? Uh, and ultimately, the only way to do that is I, in fact, have to redo the whole idea that we had for secondary structure and simply plug in membrane proteins, okay? Uh, rather than predicting helix strand other, I will now have a network that does the same thing, and this one will be transmembrane and not transmembrane. That's the entire idea. I will use the entire same machinery. I will use global information. I will use the alignment information. I will have two levels because the first level predicts two short segments and the second level will make the segments longer. Now in this particular case here, my second level sort of worked too well. Uh, the first level, the transmembrane helices are half as long as they are observed. And the second level, they are twice as long. So the effect here was a little bit too dramatic. And that is because um, when I look at transmembrane proteins, uh, we very often have helices and there's a relatively short loop in between. So finding the right cutting point, when, when you have a window of 25 consecutive residues and you want to learn that the helix doesn't stop, uh, for many you will not see that they stop and they will just look like a continued long helix. And that got me to the idea of sort of perceiving uh, trying dynamic programming like solution. So I begin with a, 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 the landscape of predicted transmembrane. So the residue number is running here on the x-axis and the y-axis is the propensity, the predicted propensity for transmembrane formation. And now I'm going to find the optimal path through that landscape. And the way I do that is very simple. I begin by simply building a pool of all the possible membrane helices. I know transmembrane helices has to be between 15 and 25 residues long. Okay? So I'm going to just compile the average score that I read off. So here's 15, here's 20, blah, blah, blah. And for, for all these, I compile the average score of the values here, right? Clear what I'm doing. I integrate over what the, the system predicted at that point, uh, which is in fact here the pool of segments. Okay? Now, if you had a model that predicts one transmembrane protein, uh, one transmembrane helix in your protein, which one would you pick from this pool? Yes, why? Because it has the highest score. This is the most reasonable thing to do. To, I mean, if you believe this protein has one transmembrane helix, that you pick the one that has the highest score is very, very, very appropriate way of doing it, right? So now if you pick this one here, so if it has one, now the question is if it had two, what is the second one you pick? Now the second highest one is this one here. You cannot pick that because you already, there is already a membrane helix, right? You have to pick the next one that has an overlap. And the next one that has an overlap is the next highest one that has an overlap is this one. So if it has two, it's those two. And you continue going. It has three, it has those three. Now, the way you continue, you can either stop when exactly there is no segment left that has, so the pool is not filling everything, right? 
So the landscape here, here will not, this will not be uh, transmembrane helix because the average will be below 0.5, right? Uh, so it, you can either go until there's none left or you can go until some threshold is surpassed or something like that. You want to ask a question yeah. or say something? Um, let's assume that 0.93 would be on the second helix position. Would you update the information? I don't know. Well, no, no, no. So again, the, the, if if you, so, if you had, if you believe that the protein has two transmembrane helices, you would still choose these two as they are, and you would not go back to this one here. Okay, so you would not take the line just because you have information that it could be longer. It could be longer. So again, I know that uh, when the method was developed, every single transmembrane helix that had been observed was between 15 and 25. Actually, it was between 18, uh, 17 and, and 23 or something like that. And I just added two on either side to, to make sure. And then I sampled the whole space okay. to, to step over what I see. Today, we have seen shorter and longer ones. So today, the story that wouldn't work as be as accurate anymore. But for, for, for the sort of generic standard proteins, the solution is very clear. Uh, and then again, so no, you would not go back because the best one was that. And it continues to be the best one if I have two. Um, if you changed the 9.5 and a 9.3, you would have <coughs> evidence that the like for example, the the, the 0.91. Yes, that, but you were still 0.95. Ah, so you so have evidence been. that those border might be correct as you have two yeah, that's domains on that. If the if the score is lower but there's more evidence because of the second one, which is still pretty high, you could like This is but but this is essentially exactly the kind of problem I escape with this algorithm, right? You're right. Uh, this is good and bad that I'm escaping that type of problem. So the 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 bad thing is I'm, I lose I may lose some things that are important, like this one may have been the generic signal. And maybe it was two, one, two membrane helices here and they will never be able to recover on that simply because there was a big one here. Uh, and or the 95 overlaps with the 91. Uh, so that is the downside to it. The upside to it is that every single, at every single step I do what is locally best until that step. If I, if I came and could reopen the can, then possibly I could find a better solution. But the better solution is not on the same scale of time. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I cannot do it. Um, okay, uh, in this particular case, and then, and then there is the, uh, the orientation, the so-called topology by the positive charged uh, charges, and then this thing for this particular problem does that. Now, uh, again, Gunnar van Eyck is involved in this paper here, uh, TMHMM, it comes from Anash Koch. Uh, Eric Sonheimer was involved and essentially is the idea to do the same thing membrane prediction with a hidden Markov model. Hidden Markov model is such a good fit for this because so that here the, the uh, lipid or the membrane runs here and the helix goes in this direction and you have a globular region, you have a connecting region on the inside, you have a cap, so something that is at the interface of lipid and water so a border region that somehow changes the sense of uh, where, where this change of environment happens. And then you get helix in and helix out, right? You have two caps here, and then you can get a short loop into a globular region, non-membrane, or get a long loop into a non-membrane, uh, in, and then in the globular region, right? Or you could go into any of these loops without a global region on the outside, just back into the membrane. That is, you can easily formulate the, the grammar put that into a hidden Markov model and put the probability for the transitions. That's why the hidden Markov model is so ideally suited to this problem because all of these local models here, the capping, there is a simple biophysics behind it. There must be a helix, the helix has an end to it, the end will see different environments, see liquid, this one will see inside liquid and uh, lipid, this will see outside liquid, Li uh, li liquid or water and lipid. So all of these are different situations and modeling them in different ways makes a lot of sense, right? What would be the um, medium error rate in, in such a system? If you, if you do a helix membrane helix prediction with a... With so a in terms of measuring it? Yeah. Um, 
That is unfortunately a, a, a very good. That is, in fact, the problem of this this model here. Uh, they're, 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 so the, what helps you in this is remember I said in that direction you cannot move that easily. That's the hammer story, right? Which means that this, in fact, is somehow firm. But unfortunately, we in a crystal we don't see the lipids. So we don't see the lipids. We don't see exactly the caps. So the assignments of what the cap region is, although in a protein it doesn't move, uh, the the degree of mistake that we make is one or two residues, which is exactly the capping region. That is one problem here. Yeah. I have a question. Why why do you differ between loop and short long loop? They, they, because the short loop has to have a lot of uh, side chains that can easily bend. So if you if you had a loop here, like in this example, where you go into the next helix and you have outside in the loop you have two or three residues, yeah. you need a lot of flexibility in that. But why don't you need it in the developing side? Uh, because it's observed less often. So typically the the okay, they are short and long, but so few that you don't exactly. distinguish them. Exactly. Okay. You are awake. Um, thank you. Impressed. Uh, so here's another solution to the same idea that comes from a group in from Istvan uh, Shimon Kabatushnadi uh, from Hungary and HMM Top using the same idea in principle. Uh, now. They, 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 they do model the, the capping regions differently, they do model the systems uh, slightly differently. Uh, so the difference in these two models are really in the details. Um, and now we get into the uh, part where... Um, so I have too many slides and I'm not entirely sure how to zip over those slides and I'm uh, going to use you as guinea pigs again uh, to see what I, what I should have stopped, uh, what I should have cut. Uh, the important part has happened so far and on Tuesday Michael is going to talk about the idea or the type of algorithms behind another way of doing it. Now I'm going to talk about the question how accurate are these methods? Uh, and one publication said uh, that in terms of correctly predicting all transmembrane uh, helices, we reach sort of 89%. So this concept I will introduce and I will talk about it again in a moment. Uh, so in, in secondary structure prediction, the concept really is Q3. You predict every single residue correctly in alpha helix or beta strand or something like that. In a membrane, what really matters is the number of helices and whether you essentially get them right. Okay, essentially get them right if that were the observed helix here uh, and that one were the predicted helix. At some point, people considered that a correct prediction because there is overlap. Today, we are more rigid about this. Today, we typically say, well, we need uh, the predicted to be less than plus minus five residues at either end here. That's the maximal difference we allow. Uh, but in the past, in fact, uh, I will show you many scores that were built upon something like this one here, uh, counting this as a completely correct prediction. Uh, because this one predicts the membrane helix, this one predicts the membrane helix, this one predicts the membrane helix, it's three times correct predictions. And, you know, uh, then there are things like, like this one here. Another story where people said, this one is an absolutely correct prediction of this. Because both membrane helices are correctly predicted. Uh, and in fact, there's even a higher overlap. So this is double counting, right? Uh, and all of these things have happened in the, in the literature. But when I talk about this OK story here, all membrane helices right, what, I, what I'm saying is I have this type of overlap for every single helix, transmembrane helix, in a protein. And I'm asking what fraction of the proteins do I achieve this? So I'm 100% right in terms of essentially placing, I, I know the number of helices, and I know essentially where, where they are placed. And the answer had been that the best methods do 89%. That, that best method is the one that I just explained to you. Uh, yes, but only in this moment. So now this yes, is the real because value. Because I have used uh, Phobius 
uh, for my bachelor thesis. Yeah, but that's long before phobias, yeah? Yeah, yeah, and, and because you were saying it's the best method because phobias has. No, I thought so. Where my question came from phobias that supposedly has a prediction success rate of over 90. We we'll get into phobias in a moment. Ah. Uh, this is pre phobias, and the point of this slide is the estimate is totally wrong. So this one says almost 90%, and this is absolutely wrong. Why is it so wrong? Uh, well, uh, all methods have been over, overestimated. Uh, no single method is best. Uh, what we do know is anything that is only using hydrophobicity is really, really, really bad. Uh, most methods somehow confuse signal peptides with memory indices. That continues to be true. Um, and eukaryotes are predicted, prokaryotes are predicted equally accurately. So why, why did that happen? Um, and the way the slides go, I'm, I'm not having the answer to that question in the next slide. Ultimately, the answer is that X-ray structures were not available for many proteins. And many of these assessments were done in low-resolution experiments, where people essentially had labeled with fluorescent dyes the protein and had seen whether the fluorescent dyes inside or outside the cell the light. Uh, and this way, they had seen the orientation, had seen the number of membrane helices and where essentially they are. Those were a lot of detailed experiments, and those detailed experiments were available for hundreds of proteins. Now, it turns out that these detailed experiments that had been used to assess the prediction methods were less accurate than the prediction methods. So that gave this idea that prediction methods solved the problem because the experiments were not, not accurate enough. Um, anyway, so ultimately the, the, the story now, which method to use, and that gets us to uh, polyphobias in a moment. Um, so the, the, the problem is going back to the, the, the major issue, and here's one answer to that. Uh, Per residue is clearly not the answer, is what this one says. We need to look at this overlap. Uh, and in the per segment overlap, here, uh, this is one solution. Uh, I'm not entirely sure this is the best one and the most recent one, and the one that I show you, should show you the most. Uh, but you see, where previously I said that 90% of the proteins are, are uh, transmembrane adhesive are correctly predicted, now we are down to 60%. Okay, and this happens to be polyphobias, the one you just mentioned. Um, now, so the next problem is that it continues to be true that membrane proteins are extremely important for, for a drug target. We need better methods to predict membrane helices because the ones we have are not good enough and the pressure to have good predictions is so high. So people develop again and again methods. And these methods are based on all the same. We have 95 proteins in this. Okay? The global prediction methods that we talked about, we can do in 10,000 proteins. Here we have 95. Uh, and so everybody uses the same data. And essentially everybody gets somehow, uh, let me overstate the case, the same results. And all of these results are slightly over-optimized for data that we already know. Uh, and this is shown somehow here. This is the data that the methods have used for training. This is a new data set. And you see they all overestimated how well they do. Uh, it's not quite true. So there are some methods in here. Uh, so the one I, I showed you, these two. Here, uh, this is the neural network-based prediction that uses profiles. That's the gunnar fedhani method and, uh, that uses this essentially the hydrophobicity, uh, and they also go down on the new data set. Although they both have been developed before any of these data were available, so they have not been optimized on these data because they didn't have it. Okay, this is 95. This is a set of 95 proteins. Both of those had one of these 95 uh, available at the time. Um, so they also go down. Less, if you observe, so the others are higher. Uh, now they, they go up less than the others. And they relatively do better in terms of, so here polyphobia is clearly out, and almost everybody outperforms those two. And this is no longer true here. 
Uh, but still, they clearly go down from here to here. So this also shows that the more recent proteins actually have features that we had not foreseen. And that ultimately gets back to what I said. The membrane helix is not quite orthogonal anymore. I'll show you a few examples of those. Um, so the, the problem here is also tougher, but you clearly see of optimization. Uh, and now back to you, Benjamin. You, you had an issue with polyphobias. No, I, I did not. I did not. However, I'm still wrapping my mind around uh, this this thing that uh, with the new proteins the performance drops down because you're saying there are new features. However, not only. So again, so the the difference. So f f the difference for those two here, the drop is new features or new, new aspects. Uh, but since the others didn't, dr didn't drop the same way, the difference in the drop for the others is over-optimization on this data set. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, I guess. So there's some drop, and I believe some drop is defined by, by whatever is the number here. Uh, visually, this number is 15, okay? So if this dropped 15 from, from where it is 65 to 40, then that drop would be the features. But you see, this is not how much it dropped. It dropped much more. And that is over-optimization. Over okay? Is that point clear? Yeah, so the model was fitted to the data and that's why it doesn't work for new proteins. Exactly. That is that part of it. Uh, and again, so the new, new, the new aspects is this and the drop between these two is overfitting. And again, it's, it's not completely overfit. 30% I mean, of the proteins, again, this is a tough number. For 30% of the proteins, all membrane helices are correctly predicted. Okay? Um, now, overall, um, the, there is a slightly different performance between eukaryotes and bacteria. There is a slightly different performance for it seems there's a slightly different performance for proteins with many membrane helices. Uh, it's lower than for uh, f fewer. And with one, it's much higher. Now, this one, again, is a problem in counting. Um, because we somehow, well, what this graph absolutely does not indicate, and actually we don't know how to, to solve this issue, but this, what you see, is not right. Uh, what you so why is it not right? Can, can you see what the problem in this graph is? So my criterion for correctness here, the QOK, means that in a protein I get all transmembrane helices absolutely right. Absolutely right is defined by this, okay? So why, 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 why is what I show you here skewed? Is the number in parentheses, is it the predicted number of helices or is it the actual number of helices? That's the actual number of helices. It's always observed up there. So what's the problem? So everything, everybody seems to be doing better on proteins with one membrane helix. What's the problem with that? If you have five pro uh, transmembrane protein helices, it's more difficult to actually fit them. Exactly. you have such a exactly. vague... Exactly. So, you know, let's, let's just look at the, for protein with one membrane helix, the number you already have, right? And then you find the only hydrophobic segment in that thing, and that may be the helix. Uh, if you have 10 or 12 or something like that, this getting, is getting much, much more complicated. The absolute random odds are different. The problem is to phrase it in the right way. Well, how would you do that? Well, you can look at difference to random. You can look at the ratio. Uh, and the reason why we didn't do that is ultimately because when we looked at the ratio, the, or when we compared looking at the ratio to random versus the difference, the absolute value difference to random, the scale of these methods changed. Uh, so whatever was best was no longer best. So we, we introduced, introduced by using the particular scale, we introduced a new ranking. And for us, that was evidence to say, if the ranking is not independent of, of the way we measure this, then there is a mistake in, in the measure. So we, we introduce a bias. We also know that we introduce a bias here. So we, we know it's wrong. We don't know, we still don't know what is right. But it's an effect that 
I want you to be aware of. It's, it's sort of a trivial effect, but... Just, just a short question. What really is random here? So you just pick... is Again, so we, have, not? Uh, so we have different random models here. Uh, and you can't even distinguish the, the different grades. The, uh, right? uh, the order, exactly. Uh, so the last one, and you see this is a very, very high here, is essentially you've picked the most hydrophobic segment. Okay? Uh, Semi-random is you know the number of uh, membrane helices and you just fit. Completely random is you don't know anything and you just randomly pick, uh, you have an average length distribution of a membrane helix and you decide how many of these you put in randomly and where you put them. That's completely random. Uh, that's the lowest one here. I have another question. Yes. Um, this might be stupid, but uh, if it's 60 proteins, right, and each of them has between two to five helices, yes. shouldn't it be then, I mean, it could only be 300 helices at most. Why is it 371 and the same with 92 and, oh, because it's a trans, so it needs, no, actually, yeah, it should be 92, the number of, of helices in the first. This is a very, very, very valid point. I assume that we have some duplication of two. No, it cannot be. Uh, well, I do, I cannot, uh, th this is not a dumb question. This is one that I cannot even solve. Um, Uh, this six times six times five is three hundred. Yeah. So even if they were all five, I, I would not quite get to the number. This is a very complicated point. We have to attack the author, Jonas. <laughs> I'm a co-author, yeah, but I'm the last one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. A very 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 valid point. Uh, and actually, the the the. So here, no, this is a duplication event. So there's something about, there are different ways of doing it. Maybe that's the answer here. Um, so they're underneath, I'm, I'm taking a lot of the complications away. So the way you assign, so in PDB you don't see the lipids. So you don't see the membrane helixes. And the way you assign the membrane, we assign the membrane helixes, they're two different databases. Mm. And we essentially said, if either of them is predict predicted right, we call it a correct prediction. So we give the prediction method the benefit of the doubt. Since they did not quite agree, these two uh, uh, annotation methods, these two databases, and maybe this is, in fact, a, here, here would appear that this is exactly the answer. So for each we count, we have the two possibilities of counting the memory helices. Uh, but that would not explain why oh, it should be a multiple of, it should be an even number. So that's the problem in that. Maybe maybe one didn't predict them. Yeah, okay. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it can be true that one has, in fact, they differ in the number, which, in fact, they do. Yeah, it could be. Could be. That could be the explanation. Yeah, most likely is the explanation. Uh, anyway, let me get to another point. What this one shows here is for many number of protein annotations for which we essentially get the number right. So, zero mistake, okay? Uh, and all methods have a high number up here. Uh, and then you also see that this is one too many and one too few membrane helices. And for most of those methods, so the mistakes predominantly sit exactly here. So in terms of number estimates, at most, so we have a bunch of methods here, and at most what they get wrong is the number plus minus one. Okay, this is still, uh, in, in some sense, a remarkable accuracy. But here is a story uh, that makes this get a little bit more complicated. If you ask, on a per protein level, how well do I identify membrane? Uh, I believe I'm through, right? Um, Okay, let me, so we identify membrane proteins fairly, fairly accurately, but to distinguish between signal peptides and membrane proteins is more complicated. Um, and I believe the ultimate point is uh, it is good enough to, membrane methods are good enough to predict for entire proteins, the repertoire of membrane proteins. Uh, there are some issues coming up with structures that, so with so called reentry helices. Uh, reentry helices, an example, is shown 
on this slide here, or it's the same, uh, where you see there's a membrane helix that is like one long helix, but it's actually not continued, because this comes from that side and that comes from that side. It looks like a long membrane helix, but it's not. Uh, there are helices that are, uh, here's the same thing again, uh, there are one that goes back like this one here. Uh, there are parts that look almost like a helix, they just wind back and forth long loops or coils. Uh, then there are parts, it's not shown here, there are things that are uh, anchoring. I've shown you some of these examples and that makes it a little more complicated to predict. Uh, there are these very long ones shown here because they, they lie at an angle. Uh, so there are additional complications that require new solutions and in some sense have opened the challenge for the field again. Um, 